Hello, this is Jeff at uh, Mississippi in the Civil War. Coming back with uh, part two of uh, This Terrible War is Still Going On, The Diary of William L. Falk, 38th Mississippi Infantry. And if you haven't seen part one, I suggest you go back and view it first, as I'm going to pick up with uh, Captain Falk's diary right in the middle of the Siege of Vicksburg, and you really need to see part one to uh, really get the full effect of part two. And before I begin with the diary, I do just want to say very quickly, uh, this presentation is based on the research I did for my master's thesis at Mississippi College. I wrote my master's on, uh, it was a regimental history of the 38th Mississippi Infantry. And once I completed my, uh, my thesis, I went, turned around and turned it into a book, uh, this book, uh, Beneath Torn and Tattered Flags, A History of the 38th Mississippi Infantry, uh, CSA, published in 1998 uh, by yours truly. It was self-published. <clears throat> I used a um, publisher, uh, printer up in Arkansas, went, drove up there, picked up the books when they were done, and then sold them myself. And I managed to sell 400 copies. I really did very well with it and was very surprised with how many I sold. But uh, the, the book's been out of print for many years. This, uh, this edition was published in 1998. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have any uh, to sell anymore. But uh, uh, I had so many people asking for it. I did uh, I take the, uh, I, the book, uh, added some material to it that I picked up over the years since the first edition came out, and uh, published a revised and expanded edition that is available on my uh, Mississippians in the Confederate Army blog on WordPress.com. So if you would like to read more about this regiment, the 38th Mississippi, the entire book, uh, the entire expanded book, is available at uh, Mississippians in the Confederate Army uh, uh, blog at uh, WordPress.com. And uh, I'm going to jump right in now to uh, Captain Falk's diary. Uh, we left off with uh, June 6th uh, with the, the regiment uh, in the line of, uh, of the fortifications at Vicksburg. They've been, been in uh, the siege lines uh, since uh, May 19th. And uh, we're going to pick up with the uh, June 7th entry by Captain Falk. And uh, on that day, the, the captain wrote, "'Tis Sabbath again, God's holy day, and all is more quiet than usual this morning. It appears that the enemy was disposed to keep the Sabbath holy. Would that we would follow their example in this respect, but we may have a warm time before night. We were shelled up to a late hour last night. 7 o'clock p.m. All has been quiet on the line today. Until now, the enemy uh, are shelling considerably. We have been in the trenches now 21 days. Our men have endured it all pretty well. God grant a speedy termination of the siege in our favor. How severe a trial to be separated from our loved ones at home and no possible chance to hear from them, and they perhaps suffering for the necessities of life. Such indeed are the horrors of war. June 8th. The enemy have been very quiet for several days past. The sharpshooters keep up a continual firing, for what reason they alone know, for they can see nothing to shoot at. Shelling moderate. They seldom ever hurt anyone. June 9th. The regiment on our left, the 3rd Louisiana, shot a fuse into some cotton bales the enemy were using as breastworks and set them on fire last night. Our sharpshooters fired into them rapidly. The cotton was burnt. One man from Company E was badly wounded. And uh, this illustration is depicting exactly what Falk was talking about. The Union troops were digging an approach trench toward the 3rd Louisiana Redan, and they had taken an old railroad car, filled it up with cotton bales, and were using it as a movable breastwork to protect their diggers as they advanced the trench. Well, the Confederates had tried and tried to destroy it with no luck, but eventually some of the Louisianans came up with an idea. They took a standard uh, mini ball, uh, some, one something like this, a 58 caliber mini ball, and these mi mini balls are hollow in the base. So they took one of these mini balls, they took some cotton, soaked it in turpentine, stuffed it into the hollow base, and then fired a bunch of them into this breastwork, into the cotton. Well, after a little while, they started seeing smoke rising up out of the cotton, and sure enough, it caught on fire and, and burned away to almost nothing. So they were able to destroy this uh, earthwork that the, uh, uh, the, the Federals were using. It was really an, an ingenious way to, to get rid of, the, of uh, 
the, the this breast work. But uh, to continue on, uh, Falk said, uh, 7 o'clock p.m., the enemy have been shooting very incessantly today, paying us up for what we did last night. But thank God we've had no one hurt. Two men from the 3rd Louisiana killed today, went into town today, and took a good bath at Major McArdle's headquarters. Saw Major McKay, Lieutenants Harrington and Smith, all improving. And uh, just a note, uh, the Major McArdle that uh, he mentions here was William H. McArdle, a resident of Vicksburg who served as Assistant Adjutant General on the staff of uh, uh, John C. Pemberton. And on June 11th, uh, Falk recorded in his diary, Yesterday was a miserable, sad, rainy day. It is very muddy and disagreeable in the trenches. The men are nearly worn out. Very heavy sharpshooting yesterday and this morning. 6 o'clock p.m. Our position has been very severely shelled today, but thank God up to this time none of our regiment have been hurt. We have been particularly blessed since we have occupied our present position. The parapet on our left has been nearly battered down with a 10-inch gun. June 12th. The shelling has not been so heavy at our position today. We may have it this evening. June 13th. The same old routine of shelling and sharpshooting still continues. We can do nothing during the day but eat and sleep, and but very little to eat, and that very common. We are all nearly worn out with the ditches, but we will hold out as long as provisions last. I could endure it cheerfully if I could know how my dear ones at home are. It has now been six weeks since, since I heard from home. Been in the trenches 27 days and no prospect of being relieved at a very early date. And uh, this illustration I used is actually one of the uh, uh, an illustration of some of the federal uh, entrenchments at Vicksburg. It's taken from Osborne Oldroyd's uh, book, Simple Story of a Soldier. He was a, uh, an enlisted man in the 20th Ohio Infantry. If you've never read his book, I highly recommend it. It's a very good memoir of, uh, of one uh, uh, Union enlisted soldier's uh, uh, service during the Civil War. June 14th, another Sabbath has rolled around and Vicksburg is still ours. Thanks to Almighty God, our loss the past week has been very small. This is a beautiful morning, and were it not for the incessant firing of the sharpshooters, all would be perfectly quiet as it should be this day. General Bear was around the lines last night. He spoke very encouragingly to the men and seems confident of our ultimate success. 7 o'clock p.m. Heavy cannonading during the day. Our mortar has annoyed the enemy very much today. Another Sabbath has passed, and we are again indebted to God for the preservation of our lives. June 15th. The feds have all their cannon along the line in use this morning. They have taken away several pieces to fight Johnston with, I suppose. 11 o'clock. Have been looking for Major McKay and Lieutenant Smith all morning. Uh, McKay and Smith came in this morning. June 17th, nothing occurred yesterday worth notice. Heavy shelling from the enemy this morning. Several pieces have fallen near us and several bombs exploded within a few feet of us. But thanks to Almighty God, we have had no one hurt yet. We are putting up several heavy guns on our lines, so reported. Our men still keep cheerful, most of them, notwithstanding their rations are very scant and becoming smaller each day. 7 o'clock, heavy shelling all day. One man killed by a sharpshooter in Company I. I am feeling unwell this evening. Hope will not be sick. We have now been in the trenches of one month today. And something uh, you'll notice as uh, Falk's diary goes on, he talks a lot about the sharpshooters. Well, the position the 38th Mississippi was in, they had a lot of problem with sharpshooters. This image uh, was made just after the siege ended, and this was taken uh, near the uh, position that the 38th Mississippi held. In fact, their position would have been off along uh, over to the left here. But you see this tower in the distance? That was known as Coonskin's Tower. And it was an Indiana soldier uh, built this thing at night using railroad ties. And he would go up in it during the day, and it was high enough that he could actually look down into the Confederate line and sharpshoot on the men that were uh, 
that expose themselves even the, the tiniest bit. So he was able to dominate the terrain around the, the 38th Mississippi's position to the left and the 3rd Louisiana's position to the right. And I'm sorry, I cannot remember that Indiana soldier's name right off the top of my head. Wait, I think it was Lieutenant Foster. Can't remember his unit, but uh, yeah, he was quite made quite a name for himself during the siege uh, as a sharpshooter. And uh, yeah, I love this image. It just shows you these are the approach trenches the Federals built up toward the Third Louisiana Redan, the front line here, and then Coonskin's Tower right up at the front. Just a great image. Oh wait, here it is. I've, I've actually got it written down. Lieutenant Henry C. Foster of the 23rd Indiana Infantry built Coonskin's Tower. June 18th, 9.30 o'clock. Shelling commenced later this morning than usual. Several bombs have exploded very near us. Corporal I. Rush of my company wounded in the arm with a piece of shell. I hope it is only slight. One man from Company K killed by sharpshooters. 7.30 o'clock, shelling not so heavy this evening. And the, the gentleman that, uh, that Falk mentions, uh, Company, uh, or Corporal I. Rush, was Isaiah Rush from Port Gibson. And in fact, in this inset picture, this is Isaiah Rush uh, much later in life, taken uh, in the 1920s. And he actually had to have his arm amputated that, uh, that was wounded when, uh, during the Siege of Vicksburg. And you see his empty sleeve there that he was you know, an amputee, lived the rest of a very long life and was very prosperous. Moved out to Texas after the war and uh, had, a, had a very good life, but uh, he'd, uh, he did have, a, have lost an arm at the Siege of Vicksburg. June 19th, heavy firing last night on the right. One man killed by a sharpshooter on the left of our regiment. He belonged to a Missouri regiment. The enemy have been unusually quiet this morning. Seven o'clock, today has passed off quietly. June 20th, six o'clock, very heavy shelling this morning. I think the enemy have planted more guns last night. The firing continued very heavy up to 11 o'clock. Three men in our regiment wounded by shells. 5 o'clock. We were very unexpectedly called into our positions in the trenches at a double quick. The alarm caused by two impudent Yankees crawling up and looking over our parapet. And that just gives you an idea of how close these, these parapets were. The Confederate ditches and the Federal approach, uh, approach had gotten so close that uh, uh, they were within easy, uh, easy uh, uh, walking and talking distance of each other. Uh, there were you know, less than a couple of feet uh, separating the Confederate trenches from the Union trenches at this point. We are now lying in the ditches already, but I think it is a false alarm. 7 o'clock. No fight today, but all quiet. I have just heard of the death of I. Ritchie of my company. He was a brave, good soldier. He died in the hospital from a wound he received in a charge on May 21st. No news from outside our lines. June 21st. Another, another Sabbath finds us still in the trenches, and I fear with but little prospect of speedy relief. We will continue to thank God for our protection of our lives when we are exposed to so many dangers. W.T. Adair of my company was wounded by a sharpshooter. I am afraid very badly. Another day has passed off quietly. Many rumors very encouraging to us from Johnston. The enemy advancing on us rapidly with their ditches. Man from Company D slightly wounded by the explosion of a shell. And the uh, uh, William T. Adair that he mentions in this uh, entry was a corporal in Company B. He was from the Port Gibson area. Uh, he was wounded and captured at Corinth in October of 1862. He was immediately paroled by the Federals, uh, recovered from his wound, and made it back to the 38th Mississippi uh, just in time for the Vicksburg campaign. Uh, he was mortally wounded and died uh, June 21st, 1863. June 22nd, the enemy unusually quiet early this morning. Another man killed in Company D from shell exploding. Today has been quiet. You know, that says something when, you know, a member of your regiment gets killed by an artillery shell, and that's a quiet day. That's a day when not much happened. You only have one man killed. It just it boggles the mind. 
And uh, this illustration uh, is uh, a model 1860 Colt Army. And this one is special because this is the one carried by Captain William L. Falk uh, during the Siege of Vicksburg. It's just still in the hands of his descendants. Uh, the, uh, the Falk family still lives in the Vicksburg area, and one of the descendants has this, uh, this uh, pistol in, the, in their possession. It's a great uh, relic of the war and of uh, Captain Falk's service in that war. Uh, June 23rd, left camp early this morning, took, bre took breakfast before leaving camp, called at the city hospital, took another breakfast with Mr. Johnston, and then another at Mrs. Lawrence's, where I got a good bath and put on clean clothes and consequently feel much better. Captain Gilmer wounded today, I hope not seriously, by a shell. I have enjoyed one day of rest and quiet and feel much refreshed. Left Mrs. Lawrence's after tea and got to camp after dark. Found it all doing well. And the Captain Gilmer that uh, Falk mentions in this entry was Captain C. L. Gilmer, the commander of Company E uh, of the 38th Mississippi. He was from uh, Lawrence County. He was wounded June 23, 1863, and uh, he, it doesn't look like he ever returned to the regiment. He was so badly wounded, uh, he was uh, he was not able to ever uh, go back into active service. June 24th, heard rapid firing from small arms about 10 o'clock last night on our right. We were called to our position in the ditches immediately, expecting a charge, but the alarm proved to be false. The enemy rather quiet this morning. They have ditched up very close to our breastworks. Another man killed in our regiment today from Company I. We thank God that our loss has been no greater. For each hour of the day, we are exposed to great danger. And uh, that was going to be very, uh, very apparent the next day, June 25th. We slept in the ditches last night in obedience to an order from General Pemberton for every man to sleep on his arms as an attack was anticipated, but the night passed off quietly. God in his wisdom see, has seen fit to take from us one of our best soldiers, Alec Cameron. who was He was good in all that constitutes a soldier, brave, noble, and true one who never shrank from danger or murmured at duty, always ready to encourage the men under the greatest hardships and privations. He was shot by a sharpshooter in the left eye while looking over the parapet last night about nine o'clock. His death has cast a gloom over our little company, and it will be long before we can realize that Alec is no more. Major McKay went into town sick again last night. Seven o'clock p.m., the enemy attempted to blow up the parapet of the 3rd Louisiana and partially succeeded and threatened us with a charge. We remained in the ditches all night. Two men of Company C and one in Company E wounded today by explosion of shell. Another man in Company C wounded by sharpshooters. And the, the explosion he's talking about is illustrated here in this, uh, this image. The Federals actually dug a mine under the 3rd Louisiana Redan packed it with black powder, several thousand pounds of black powder, uh, set a fuse to it, and then uh, uh, set it alight. After it exploded, it pretty much destroyed the 3rd Louisiana Redan. Uh, the Confederates, though, had, had uh, known that the, the Federals were, were digging, assumed they were digging a mine, and had built a new earthwork in back of their, their uh, original earthwork. So... When the uh, dust settled from the explosion, a, a Union attack force went down into that crater, and the Confederates on the other side just met them with a hailstorm of fire. They remained in that, that crater overnight, fighting pretty much all night, but they were never able to get up out of there, and it really became kind of a death pit for hundreds of Union soldiers. It was some really bloody fighting, some of the bloodiest of the entire siege. And eventually, the Federals realized uh, uh, the, the mine had not worked. They were not able to, to successfully break through the Confederate line, and they pulled their troops back. Now, that didn't stop them from uh, uh, firing another mine into the 3rd Louisiana Redan later uh, uh, during the siege, but they didn't uh, follow that one up with an attack. And uh, if the siege had gone on a little bit longer, they had, did have plans to uh, set off a number of other mines and, and follow those up with charges as well. But uh, fortunately, the siege ended uh, before that, that happened. On uh, June 26th, uh, Falk said, We are looking for an attack from the enemy this morning. 
very heavy sharpshooting in front of our position since last night. And unfortunately, at this point, there are seven pages of the diary missing. Uh, everything from after Ju uh, this, they've got the first sentence of the June 26th entry. And then unfortunately, the narrative now skips to July 2nd. And uh, this is right at the very end of the siege. So um, unfortunately, we're missing, we're missing some, uh, uh, several days of, of the action, but uh, we have to pick back up. Uh, with the July 2nd uh, uh, entry, which starts off in, in the middle of a sentence. But it says, July 2nd, uh, of my company was badly wounded by a shell in the arm. He's actually, he's talking about one of his men who's been been uh, shot or with a piece of shrapnel. It has since been amputated, which I regret very much. Another man killed in Company I today by a sharpshooter. We are losing men very rapidly. And uh, the the man that uh, is not named in this entry who had his arm amputated was 4th Sergeant John Gibson Goza of Company B. His uh, service record states uh, uh, arm shot off July 2nd, 1863. And the uh, image right here is one I took a few years ago. And this shows the position of the 38th Mississippi Infantry uh, in, the, uh, in the line uh, just to the right of the 3rd Louisiana Redan. And uh, it's a little hard to see, but under this tree, there is a cannon tube in the ground. And uh, that marks the spot where uh, Grant and Pemberton were going to meet to have their surrender negotiations. So the 38th Mississippi was going to have a uh, frontline view to uh, the, the end of the Siege of Vicksburg. And uh, on July 3rd, uh, Captain Falk wrote, We have had a, a quiet day of it. A flag of truce was sent over to the enemy at 8 o'clock this morning which lasted about one hour when another flag was sent over. We are very anxious to know what it all means. Five o'clock. Three or four of our generals are in front of our regiment with the same number of federal officers holding a conference. And uh, the meeting you know, of Grant and Pemberton and their staffs took place literally out in front of the, the 38th position. So they, they got to witness all of this firsthand. They, they saw history made. And... The, uh, the city of Vicksburg was surrendered by John C. Pemberton uh, to Ulysses S. Grant on July 4th. And uh, on that day, July 4th, 1863, uh, Falk recorded this, this message in his diary. Another meeting of the officers on each side about 10 o'clock last night, and still another about 3 o'clock this morning, the result of which was our surrender at 10 o'clock today. How humiliating it is for us to be compelled to submit to such an enemy and that too on the 4th of July. But we would have done, we, we have done all that men could do. We held them 48 days, it's actually 47 days, he miscounted by one day, but on, we held them 48 days on very scant rations and would have continued to hold this place had our rations held out. The feds and our men are mixing together and talking good humoredly. And this is a pretty good illustration of uh, the a Confederate surrender taking place. The men are stacking their arms and they're they're uh, advancing out of their trenches to be paroled. And on July 5th, uh, Captain Falk recorded, today has been the only quiet Sabbath we have passed since we have been in Vicksburg. We are anxiously waiting for our paroles for we are very tired of this place. And in fact, this is the parole that was signed by Captain William L. Falk. And it's, it simply says, uh, to all who, whom it may concern, know ye that William L. Falk, a captain of Company B, 38th Mississippi Volunteer CSA, being a prisoner of war in the hands of the United States forces in virtue of the capitulation of the city of Vicksburg and its garrison by Lieutenant General John C. Pemberton, CSA, commanding on the 4th day of July, 1863, do in pursuance of the terms of said capitulation, give this my solemn parole under oath that I will not take up arms again against the United States, nor serve in any military police or constabulary force in any fort, garrison, or field work held by the Confederate States of America against the United States of America, nor as a guard of prisons, depots, or stores, nor discharge any duties usually performed by officers or soldiers against the United States of America until duly exchanged by the proper authorities. That meant 
the Confederates captured at Vicksburg all had their names taken down. They were all counted. And the Confederates and the Federals had what were known as parole commissioners. They would get together and swap these lists of men they had captured. And once you had swapped uh, the men you captured for the men they captured, they would be declared exchanged and paroled, and then they could go back to their uh, go back to fighting. But at least for a, a for a, a month or so after the siege of Vicksburg, the men in the 38th were going to get to go home. They were going to get to see their families, and they were going to get to uh, uh, get away from the war for a little while. And uh, more than a few decided, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going back. Uh, I've had enough. And uh, a lot of men got demoralized by the capitulation of Vicksburg and just uh, they deserted. They went AWOL. They were not going to go back, but but most of them did. Uh, the 38th Mississippi was going to be uh, uh, brought back into service uh, by the end of 1863, and they would fight through to the end of the war. And the last entry that uh, Captain Falk has in his diary, July 9th, we have been lying in camp here since the 4th, waiting for orders to leave. The feds have issued an order prohibiting any Negro from passing their lines. Uh, they didn't want the Confederates trying to take any of their slaves with them. Uh, they wanted the, the, those men to uh, stay in Vicksburg um, and, uh, and not follow their, their masters out. And uh, so they, they didn't allow them to accompany the Confederates out. Uh, it looks very hard for many of them as they are anxious to return to their homes. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. They may have been, but uh, I think a lot of them probably were very happy to stay in Vicksburg, and uh, more than a few of them would end up joining the United States Colored Troops uh, very shortly that were being organized in Vicksburg. But uh, just to give you a little overview, to give you an idea of what the Siege of Vicksburg cost one regiment, the 38th Mississippi, they went into the Siege of Vicksburg with about 300 men. During the siege, during that 47-day period uh, from May to July of 1863, they had, this 300-man regiment had 35 men killed, three of them officers, 32 enlisted men and five officers wounded, and two men missing. The total killed, wounded, and missing was 74. 74 out of 300. That's a pretty uh, significant loss. And, uh, the, the Siege of Vicksburg really stuck with the men in the 38th for the rest of their lives. It was a, a battle they never forgot. Uh, being in those kind of cramped conditions, under shell fire and, and mini ball fire for 47 days straight, it, uh, it uh, is a, something you're not going to forget. And it, it was a powerful memory for the men that fought through it. And uh, if you would like to read more uh, about the Siege of Vicksburg, um, there's a very good book by uh, uh, Willie Tunnard, who was in, in the 3rd Louisiana, which was uh, in, a, in the 38th Mississippi's Brigade. Uh, he, he published a regimental history of the 3rd Louisiana Infantry right after the war. It, it was called A Southern Record, published in 1866, written while it was still very fresh in Tunnard's mind. That's a very good uh, book. I highly recommend it. Uh, if you would like to read more by a member of the 38th Mississippi, there's an excellent article. It's written many years after the war, but uh, I think it's fairly accurate. It's called The Rank and File at Vicksburg uh, by uh, James Henry Jones, who was captain of Company D of the 38th Mississippi during the Siege of Vicksburg. And it's available in the publications of the Mississippi Historical Society. I think it's volume seven. Uh, but uh, if you have any questions about the Siege of Vicksburg or about the 38th Mississippi, uh, please leave them for me. I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and I'll be coming back with more uh, of, of this uh, sort of thing shortly. If you liked it, uh, please uh, leave, a, uh, leave a thumbs up and, uh, and a comment, because it really helps me gauge uh, what kind of uh, viewership I'm getting. And uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, have a good evening.